The Battle of Armageddon. Everyone knows its name. Some thought it might have been the war in the Persian Gulf. Others thought it would be a nuclear war between the United States and Russia. Ancient Bible prophecies about the Battle of Armageddon have long spawned fear in the hearts of men. Are you afraid of Armageddon? The last message on this tape is titled, The Battle of Armageddon. Surely we can bring to pass a time of peace. Surely we are intelligent enough in order to manage the problems between nations so as to take away the devastation of war, which has occurred so many, many times across the world. That's the cry, that's the plea of hearts today. Surely we can put together some kind of a new world order so we don't have to grind up the nations against one another from time to time. This is certainly the hope in the heart of practically every person. It's certainly the fond hope of the nations of the world today. As never before, they are talking about the utter necessity of peace because they say, look, we have nuclear weapons. We have the possibility of exterminating one another. The issue is critical. We must find a way to bring to pass peace on earth. Enormous pressure along those lines today. And I rather guess that one can safely say that from this day on, we're going to hear more about the utter necessity of world peace than we have heard in most of our lifetimes. Now that fond hope is certainly understood, but it presses the question, are we going to have peace? Will it be possible to bring to pass peace on earth? I'm afraid that I must answer that question by saying no. We've got to understand it right up front. The Bible says that the world is infected by a dreadful disease called sin, and it makes people wicked. And so the scripture says, there is no peace, says my God to the wicked. Just when you think you've got it glued together, along comes another person like an Adolf Hitler, a Saddam Hussein, a Benito Mussolini or whatever, and suddenly the world is embroiled in war again. That's what we can expect from here on out, and that's why we want to take the time to talk about the wars that will characterize the end time. There is the Battle of Haman Gog that you know about. And now let's think about that awful culmination type battle that will take place in the world. And it is called the Battle of Armageddon. There's coming a period of time which the Bible calls the Tribulation. And that will be a period of time in which the world will face up to what it really is. It will be a period of time that's the beginning of an era called the day of the Lord in which the judgment of God will fall upon man and man will face the consequences of his attitude of rebellion against God. But that time called the tribulation, which could begin in, a, in the relatively near future, is called by a very special name in the word of God. The prophet Jeremiah talks about this and he says, alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So in thinking of the battle of Armageddon, which will bring to pass the, 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 the consummation of that period of time, which is called the tribulation, it is characterized by a set of activities which the Bible calls Jacob's trouble. Now, how does this work? The nation of Israel is already back in the land in the Middle East. It's that narrow sliver of land that is surrounded by trouble already. So that Israel has always had to think in terms of making an alliance with somebody in order that Israel may be able to survive and be protected. What's happening now is that Israel is becoming disillusioned with its old friends like the United States. And so the Bible, when it speaks about the advent of the Antichrist, the prince that shall come, particularly in Daniel's prophecy, then it talks about this person and says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many. The word is the many, meaning Israel, for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So the Bible says that there will be a covenant, a covenant between the nation of Israel and another protector, and that protector will make that covenant on the basis of guaranteeing the borders of Israel against its enemies, moving to the defense of the nation of Israel. We can kind of picture how that happens. Here is Israel, and Israel is surrounded by an infinity of hatred on the part of the Arab world. 
Israel has depended upon the United States to be its protector, in fact, its only friend in the world. But there comes a time when that friend, the United States, is no longer thought reliable by Israel, and that time is now. Will you help us is the question that the Israelis have, and the answer is maybe. But maybe is not good enough when your life is at stake. It has to be yes. So you can count on Israel looking for another protector, looking across the world and saying, who can we depend upon that will help us stay alive when times of trouble come upon us as they already have? Well, that person emerges. He is the leader of Europe. He is called in the Bible, the prince that shall come. And the prince that shall come has an interest in Israel. The interest is that his oil, his energy supply has come out of the Middle East, and so he has to make a covenant with the nation of Israel to keep that supply going. Israel has a very definite interest in a new, strong protector. They will ask the question, what is the emergent political force in the world? Who will be strongest tomorrow? Their answer to that question is Europe. Europe is coming together as the United States of Europe. Let's be friends. We want to be not just a Mideast power. We want to be a Mediterranean power, says the people of Israel. So they make a deal with the leader of Europe. And that deal is a covenant. If you'll notice by looking at the map, the only really practical place for a landfall in which the military powers of Europe could move into the Middle East is by having that landfall in the nation of Israel. From there, they could reach out and with military force protect the oil pipelines that feed Europe its energy. So they make a deal with the nation of Israel. And that deal with the nation of Israel is, we will protect you and, and guarantee your borders and we will not let those hostile Arabs take over and overwhelm you. And in return, you will give us the opportunity of operating militarily out of the nation of Israel. Now the Antichrist, the leader of Europe, makes many other promises to the nation of Israel. We will help you rebuild the temple. We will establish you as a respectable nation across the world. You can count on us as being partners in progress. And so a covenant is made. What happens to that covenant? Does it become the key to peace, an alliance between Israel and the nations of Europe? That question can mean a lot to you and to me. Let's talk about it in a moment. Will there be peace in days to come? We agree that this is the great call among the nations of the world. In fact, with just a touch of memory, most of us will be able to remember that practically every dictator who has ever come to pass in the history of the world did so at the promise of peace. Elect me, put me into power, and I will guarantee that there will be peace in the world. Usually the promise of that dictator has been peace on the basis of national supremacy. So it was with Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, and all of these. But the promise of peace has always been the great cry of the world. I have been to international conferences in a number of places across the world, and I find that the speakers that are making the most impression upon people are those who are talking about peace. They advocate comity. They have a plan by which the nations of the world will get together once again. Now, there is that arrangement made between Israel and the king of Europe, the one who handles that 10 nation complex that aspires to rule the world. But according to the scripture, this arrangement does not produce ultimate final blessing to the nation of Israel, but it produces this time called Jacob's trouble. What happens? Well, what happens is according to the prophet Daniel is that this covenant that is made between the Antichrist and the nation of Israel, this covenant is a promise, but a promise that is broken. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That is a week of years. It's a seven year period that the Antichrist guarantees to be friends with Israel. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's an interesting expression. What he does is he helps the people of Israel build a temple. And he finally agrees that perhaps even Israel represents the true religion. And so that temple is built. But that becomes such an attraction to the world and uh, embodiment of the Judeo Christian heritage that the Antichrist says, look, I can use that for my own purposes. I can use that in order that the world may recognize who I truly am, not just a man, 
but God. And so that covenant that he has made with the nation of Israel, he will break and he will say, this is not the true worship, but a prelude to the true worship. I represent the one true God in human form who has come to pass in the world and has come back to you for the purpose of producing peace on earth and goodwill toward men. So he breaks the covenant that he had with the nation of Israel. And the Bible says that he makes an image of himself, an image, by the way, which is enabled to speak. And that image he places in the temple. So the Bible says that he, the Antichrist, and then the image that he leaves there sits in the temple showing himself that he is God. Well, this is too much for the people of Israel. Even they can't stand this gross blasphemy from a friend. And so they rebel against him. And that really brings to pass Jacob's trouble in that Israel becomes the object of a tremendous persecution on the part of the Antichrist. There will be days of carnage. Israel's cycle of discipline is not done as yet. A very real percentage of the population will be killed by the Antichrist. The rest will flee, possibly into the rose-red city called Petra. Israel will have pressed upon her a terrible time of persecution. But during that time, Zechariah says, God will open to Israel a fountain of cleansing, and Israel will think about itself and about its God. And Israel then will have a special dispensation of grace opened up to them. In fact, the Bible says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced, and they will say, Whence are the wounds in thine hand? And he will say, These are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And so Romans chapter 11 says, And so all Israel shall be saved. Out of that persecution, God brings to pass not a terrible consequence, but a blessed con uh, a consequence. These stubborn members of the nation of Israel that so long have resisted divine grace, called, but God calls them a, a hard-nosed and a stiff-necked people. They will suddenly realize how wrong they've been, and they will be converted to Christ, and they will become Christians. But now there is a occurrence that takes place in the midst of all of this, that I think to be very provocative. It produces a tremendous indignation across the world. Now, let me make you a suggestion as to what that occurrence is. Babylon is still around. As you know, Babylon has been in part destroyed as a result of, a, of an assembly of great nations. But the Bible says there are three entities that will destroy Babylon. That assembly of great nations, and a single great nation to the north, and then Israel will be used to deliver the final coup d'etat against the land of Babylon. But listen to what the Bible says. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved and a cry is heard among the nations. That's Jeremiah 50 verse 46. So there's a cry of indignation that comes because Babylon has been attacked and destroyed. In my judgment, Israel is finally brought to the place where it must use nuclear capability against Babylon. And so it organizes a nuclear strike against the land of Babylon and the whole place explodes. And the nations just about ready to promise peace on earth and goodwill, just about ready to say we have completed our plan under the leadership of the Antichrist and all of this is tremendously indignant. The nations of the world set up a cry against the people of Israel. And what will be the result of that? The result of that will be one of the most astonishing gathering of nations that has ever happened in the history of the world. The Bible says every nation, every nation will put together a segment of that mighty army and they will finally march. And they will march where? To the Middle East for what purpose? For the purpose of going against Israel and against the city of Jerusalem. As a consequence of the nations of the world gathering against the city of Jerusalem, there will be a tremendous result so spectacular that you could never make a movie about it. It will be a marvelous form of divine intervention, which will come to pass in the world for the whole world to see. What will be the nature of that divine intervention and what does that have to do with you and with me? A very important answer to that question in a moment. We are considering a most awesome thing. 
when we think about the nations of the world finally coming to the place of the culmination of God's program for those nations, namely the Battle of Armageddon. Before that battle is a seven-year period which the Bible calls a time of Jacob's trouble in which the Israelis go through the last cycle of discipline that God brings upon them because of their rejection of Jesus Christ. However, there is an activity done by the nation of Israel that produces a cry among the nations so that a vast wave of indignation moves across the world, especially concerning Israel and in a larger sense concerning God himself. It is my judgment that the nations by that time, as the tribulation moves along, will be so scarred by the internecine wars, so disillusioned with it all, and yet so utterly convinced that humanism, atheism, is what to believe. They will have organized a common one world religion. And one of the most interesting studies, by the way, that anybody could make is to study the religion, that is the single religion, of the last days. It will be an anti-God proposition all the way. Finally, it culminates to the place where the nations of the world, indignant against Israel and against God and against the Judeo-Christian heritage, they actually bring to pass a vast international army military activity against the nation of Israel. Zechariah describes this, believe me, I'm not inventing these things out of my own head. Zechariah says, the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, who stretches forth the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of, a cup of trembling to all the peoples round about, and they shall be in a siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Describing this, David in the second Psalm speaks with indignation and says, why do the nations rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us cast off their cords from us. Let us be free of the influence of God is what the nations say. And so they come together against the city of Jerusalem and the Holy Land, wanting to do away once and for all with what is seen as the connection God has with the world, namely that Judeo-Christian heritage. They march against Jerusalem. We have seen that at that time God says, I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they shall look on me whom they have pierced, and that will be a touchstone of their conversion. In that day, Zechariah says, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness, which results in the conversion of the nation of Israel. But finally, it all comes to pass where it looks like Jerusalem is in a hopeless position with the nations of the world arrayed against her. And that's the culmination days of the tribulation. But what happens? Israel, having been converted, falls on its knees and says, this is too much for us. We can't handle this. It looks like the end of everything. But alas, it is not the end of everything, but rather it is in a very real sense, the beginning of everything. What happens as a culmination of that battle, which is called the Battle of Armageddon? The Battle of Armageddon, by the way, will be in various stages as it moves up to Jerusalem. 200 million men will move into an army that is virtually destroyed in the plains of Jezreel. And that's the Armageddon situation. But finally they gather against Jerusalem and it looks like things are hopeless, that the devil and the Antichrist will indeed win. But what does the Bible say? John is speaking now saying, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were like a flame of fire on his head were many crowns and he had a name written and no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God, the ultimate composite of final truth. And the armies that were in heaven followed him clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now there's an astonishing development. Armies come from heaven with a returning Christ. Who are those armies? Well, Jude says, behold, he comes 
with ten thousands of his saints. And a saint, of course, is everyone who has believed the gospel. So the army that comes with Christ, clothed in fine linen, is who? It is the saints of God. That is, believing people who have come to know Christ as personal Savior, you will be a part of that army that will produce the final conquest of the world in the name of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful destiny is yours. So look, my advice is, do not believe the world's program to bring peace simply on the base of hum humanistic philosophy, but rather believe, as the Bible says, that finally the world will run out of its capacity to be indignant against God and the world will be conquered by the invasion from heaven of which Christ will be the leader and you and I will be the part. What a marvelous destiny lies ahead then for every believing Christian in the light of that day, even this day, remember that you can walk in triumph for our soon coming Savior. You know, the most marvelous.